If you would, please take your Bibles and turn to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. That's where we're going to be spending the entirety of our time tonight. And I'll go ahead and turn there with you. Matthew chapter 10. Instructions are an important part of ensuring that you're going to produce the outcome that you want to give. If you've been like me and you've decided that you were going to do something without the instructions, you will soon realize that you get the pleasure of doing something twice. First, the way that you think it ought to be done, and secondly, the way it's supposed to be done. And many times I have got something out of a box, put it together, and Brittany was just waiting for it to go wrong. And, uh, and I've got to disassemble everything, take out the instructions, and then follow it step by step. You see, uh, if we don't have instructions, then we don't have a really good idea of where to go. But instructions aren't the only way that we get to where we're going to go or, or how we get to the path. The second thing we have to have is motivation. You see, uh, many influential and famous speakers have given instruction and motivation in their speeches. Theodore Roosevelt and his famous duties of an American citizen, or Winston Churchill's We Will Fight on the Beaches, or maybe even Douglas MacArthur's uh, Courage, Duty, and Honor. And so motivation has caused the tide to turn in athletic competitions, in military campaigns, and even in one's own personal life. You see, if you have instruction without motivation, it is inspiring and dull. If you have motivation without instruction, it is fleeting and unsustainable. But when you have instruction coupled with motivation, you are virtually unstoppable. In Matthew chapter 10, we have both of these things together. You see, some of you have graduated high school. You're about to embark on a new journey in your life, and before you go, I think you need to listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 10. Many of you are going to leave the auditorium tonight and go to your workplaces tomorrow. Well, before you go, you need the instruction and the motivation of Jesus in Matthew 10. In Matthew 10, we have one of the longest discourses of Jesus in the New Testament. And many people can tell you about the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, verse, verses 5 through 7. Many can tell you about the Sermon on the Plains or Jesus' instruction in John 14 through 17. But Matthew chapter 10 is often over looked as one of the longer discourses of Jesus' ministry. And in Matthew chapter 10, the disciples are sent out on a limited commission. Now, of course, we know about the Great Commission in Matthew 28 when Jesus gives the disciples that commission before He is taken up into heaven on the clouds. But in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus takes the disciples that have been with Him and by His side for months on end. And He gives them a limited charge to go and to preach and to teach and to heal and to cast out demons. And before He sends them on this journey, the entirety of Matthew chapter 10 is Him instructing them and teaching them and motivating them for the obstacles that are before them. And I think through inspiration, Jesus is offering the same thing to you and I, His disciples today, before we go to school or our workplaces, to give us instruction and motivation and how we are to live our life. And so in Matthew chapter 10, the first thing I want us to see here is that we are an extension of Jesus' ministry. Jesus' ministry in Luke 19, 10, He self-prescribes is coming to seek and to save the lost. And of course, the disciples were an extension of Jesus' ministry. Jesus had them in Matthew chapter 10 for months on end, training them and teaching them, preparing them for this limited commission. They would come back and Jesus would grade them and ask them how they did and He would continue to instruct them for a few more months before they sent them out on their final mission, the Great Commission. You see, you and I, although different than the apostles and the disciples in Matthew 10, but we are an extension of Jesus' ministry. We have been given the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 18 through 20 still says, Go, all authority in heaven has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I've commanded to you, and behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. If the work of Christ is going to be accomplished today, it is going to be accomplished through the church. If the work of Christ is going to be accomplished in this community, it'll be through the church in this community. And that's you and I. And oftentimes we look around and think, well, somebody else will say something. Somebody else will do something. But if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, you have been given that commission, each and every one of us. We can ask ourselves, how on earth did 13 apostles 
the 11 apostles minus Judas. Matthias is added in, in Acts chapter 1. Then Paul comes along in Acts chapter 9. 13 apostles. How did 13 apostles, how were they able to teach and preach? And within a matter of decades, tens of thousands of people become Christians. How did they do it? And the answer is, they didn't. It wasn't just 13 guys. It was all Christians owning the fact that they too were an extension of the ministry of Jesus. In Acts chapter 8 verse 4, as Paul is breathing threats against the church, as the Jews are starting to persecute the church there in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas, Christians disperse throughout the Mediterranean world. And in Acts chapter 4 verse 8 tells us, Now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. And so each and every individual in the early church took it upon themselves to be a missionary, to be a preacher, to be someone that was going to herald the good news of salvation to those that they came into contact with. Many people have asked, you know, Isaac, why is the church growing today like it was in the 1950s? Well, we're not talking to our friends, our families, our neighbors about Christ like perhaps they were in the 1950s. Uh, we've been so secularized, so uh, pigeonholed that we feel awkward talking to someone about our faith. And the Bible tells us that that's our main mission in life is to be able to express our faith and our relationship with Christ with those around us. And when we decide that we're going to truly own the fact that we are an extension of Jesus' ministry, well, then we're going to have the motivation, just like these Christians in Acts chapter 8, verse 4, to preach the Word of God everywhere that we go. Because just like those disciples, we have been given a commission, a great commission to spread that gospel. The second thing that we can learn from Matthew chapter 10 is to know when to leave. If you look at verse 14 of Matthew chapter 10, as Jesus is instructing them, He says, and if anyone will not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet, and when you leave that house or your town. The Jews would customarily shake the dust off their feet if they were traveling through a Gentile region so they would not contaminate the holy soul of the nation of Israel, Amos 7.17. We can see that Paul and Barnabas actually did this themselves in Acts chapter 13, verses 50 through 51. They went to Antioch of Pisidia and they were not welcomed there. The people didn't listen to what they had to say. And so when they left, they literally shook the dust off their feet. You know, sometimes as Christians, we've got to know when we've got to leave. You know, Paul and Barnabas didn't get upset in Antioch of Pisidia. They didn't say, you know what, we've been stoned in Lystra. We've been unaccepted in Pisidia. This is too hard. It's too tough. The people won't listen. People are different today than they were 30 years ago. This, people just won't listen to us anymore. And they didn't stop. They didn't pack up their bags and go back to Antioch and give up on missions. They didn't give up on preaching and teaching. In fact, Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 9, 16, Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. That's the type of attitude that he had because he truly believed that he was an extension of Jesus' ministry. But he took Jesus' words to heart here in Luke, I mean Matthew 10, verse 14, even though technically he wasn't even there. He shook the dust off his feet. Uh, sometimes when you're trying to talk with someone about Jesus, they're not going to listen. And don't get frustrated. Don't get angry. Don't get sad or upset. Just realize it's not the right season for them. And it may never be the right season, but just shake the dust off your feet, literally or figuratively if you want to, and just go to the next person and go to someone else because that's what the disciples did. That's the instruction. That's what Jesus did Himself. Jesus would go into a town like Capernaum, even His own city. And Jesus would say, you know, you guys are going to be worse for you in the day of judgment than Sodom and Gomorrah. He would go to Nazareth and He would say, there's no honor for a prophet in his own hometown. And so if the Lord was rejected, if Paul was rejected, you too will face a time when you try to share your faith with someone. They're not going to care. They're not going to listen. It's okay. <laughs> That's fine. That's a mark on them, not on you. Shake the dust off your feet and go to the next person. Jesus did not give the option of quitting to His disciples then, and He does not give that option to you and I today. Unfortunately, many Christians have found themselves to have shared their faith once or twice to be rejected and decide it's just easier to say nothing at all. Well, at that point, we become a disobedient disciple because we're no longer trying to fulfill the commission that God has given us. The third thing that we can learn from this passage here is persecution will come. Let's look at verses 16 through 18 and then verses 21 through 22. 16 through 18 and 21 through 22. 
Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in the, their synagogues, and you will be dragged from governors and kings and for my sake to bear witness before them and to the Gentiles. Now verse 21. Brother will deliver brother over to death, and father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Often persecution has come from three separate places, the three places that Jesus mentions here. Those persecutions will come from our own physical families. They'll come from the religious establishment or the government. And they'll come from those who are outside of Christ entire or outside of any type of Christendom altogether. Regardless of where the persecutions come, Christ did not give the apostles the option to waver in their faith or waver in their commitment to Him. In John 15, 18 through 22, Jesus says, If the world hates you. Know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you were not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember this word that I have said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. And if I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. You see, the world rejected Jesus because he stood for righteousness. The world rejected Jesus because he wasn't afraid to call sin, sin. And the world is going to reject us. It's going to reject us for the exact same reasons, because we're going to call sin, sin. Because we're going to strive to live a holy life. And if the world rejects you for those things, that's okay. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, before he himself is about to be martyred, he says, If you are insulted for the name of Jesus Christ, if you, you are blessed because the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler, yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. Many times we find ourselves doing the exact opposite of what Peter tells us in this verse. Many times we try to live as a Christian, we try to talk to people about our faith, and we're rejected because we're narrow-minded, we're too pharisaical, we're too legalistic. Whatever adjective you want to throw at it, you guys are the only ones think you're going to heaven. And we become ashamed of the name Christian. We become ashamed of the church of Christ. We do the exact opposite thing that Peter tells us in 1 Peter 4, 14 through 16. Not everybody is going to welcome your advances. Not everyone's going to welcome the gospel. But do not be ashamed. Peter says you're glorifying God while you're doing those things. Glorify the fact that you have enough gumption within yourself to stand firm in the faith, regardless of what men may say about you or do to you. And yet we have allowed Satan to infiltrate the church and to infiltrate our hearts, and we become ashamed to say that Christ has His church. To say that you have to be baptized for your sins to be inside of Christ. Don't be ashamed about those things. Don't be ashamed to say those things. Because when you do, you're allowing yourself to be ashamed for the very thing that Peter says that you ought to have glory in. The fact that you know those things, you've done those things, and you're trying to share that with others so that they too might experience the salvation that you have. Don't allow Satan to make you feel ashamed over something that you're supposed to feel glory in. Because that means you're going to be like that person in John chapter 12, verse 43. Why do we feel shame? Why do we stand back and why do we refuse to say anything? Well, if we do that, we're going to find ourselves in violation of 1 Peter 4, 14 through 16, and find ourselves just like the man in John 12, 43, when Jesus was listening to the Pharisee, and he was saying his prayers out loud. Jesus said that they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. If you know God wants you to say something, but you don't, because it might offend somebody else, are you not the same person as the one that Jesus says in John 12, 43, that loves to praise or the acceptance of men more than the acceptance of God? Yeah. Have you ever done that? I have. And so we've got to be better. Uh, we don't have to be arrogant, but we do have to be humble enough to say, you know what, I'm going to say something. I'm going to tell other people about Jesus, about His church, about His gospel. And if it offends them, that's on them. But if I refuse to say anything, if I allow myself to be shamed, 
that I myself am seeking the praise of men and not the praise of God. Persecutions will come, but the question is, how are we going to respond to that? Because the Word of God is not spread through the sword of warfare. It's spread through the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, and Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. We've got to be able and strong enough to stand up and say something, because that's the only way the gospel message, the sword of the Spirit, is going to be able to get out there and make a difference in the world. If we decide to do something in spite of the persecutions or the shame that people try to put on us. The fourth thing that we can learn from this passage is be courageous. There's no room for fear in the church of God. Let's read verses 28 through 31 of Matthew chapter 10. Verses 28 through 31. And do not fear those who will kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both the soul and the body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And are not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father? But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, for you are more worthy than sparrows. Man can kill the body, but he cannot kill the soul. And although that we can experience the second death, which is the lake of fire, Revelation 20, verse 14, where eternal punishment will take place, Matthew chapter 25, 46, we don't have to experience those things if we are in Christ. We're not supposed to fear man, despite what he may be able to do to our physical bodies, but we are to fear God who has the ability to destroy our bodies and our souls in hell. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10 tells us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. James 4.12 says we must fear Him because He is the one who is able to save us or to destroy us. And if we are in Christ, then God is with us. And we don't have to worry about persecutions. We don't have to worry about the shame that comes, that might come with standing up and speaking up for Christ and His church. We don't have to worry about those things because God is on our team. He's on our side. Romans chapter 8, verse 31 says, If God is for us, who can be against us? And 1 John chapter 4, verse 4 says, Greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. When you have Christ on your team, you don't have to worry about anything else because you know that you're going to win, that you're going to be sure, that you're going to be victorious because God promises that in His Word. There's no room for fear. Uh, Timothy tells, Paul tells young Timothy, as Timothy was trying to, to carry on his ministry, his mentor Paul was no longer away but in prison and about to be uh, beheaded himself. And so Paul was trying to encourage Timothy, and he says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. Christians aren't supposed to be people who are afraid. They're supposed to be people who have no fear, who are courageous, because they know the outcome of the game before it even starts. That we will be victorious in Christ if we are faithful, Revelations 2.10. And because we know that, we have the motivation to persevere and to be dedicated to the cause of Christ. Let's read verses 38 through 39 of our text. 38 and 39. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Bearing your cross. This is the first time the word cross is mentioned in the New Testament. Bearing your cross beam. What oftentimes the criminal, the one who was condemned, would have to carry the cross beam. I've forgotten exactly just how much it weighed, but I believe it was somewhere between about 75 and 100 pounds. And so the criminal would have to carry their cross beam to the straight, up and down erected pole that was already in a fixed place. And they would take that cross beam that the criminal had carried from the place where he was condemned, fix it to that singular beam that was standing up, and that's where he would be crucified. You see, the imagery here is when you take your cross beam, you're going somewhere. Now, you're not just taking your cross beam to the marketplace. You're taking your cross beam to that erected pole that you're going to be crucified on. Jesus says, take up your cross, your cross beam, and follow me. When we follow Christ, we've got to be sure that we have the perseverance and the dedication that no matter what happens in this life, even if I've got to take that cross beam to that erected pole and be crucified with Christ, literally, I'm going to make that decision. That's where I'm going to go because I'm going to follow Christ. That's the type of perseverance and dedication that I have. Luke 9, 21 says, 23 says that that cross beam, we've got to carry it each and every day. Jesus also says something about finding yourself. 
You see, in this life, we're all trying to find ourselves and who we are. Now, sometimes people say, you know, they're out finding themselves. Well, people try all types of activities to find themselves. They try sports, hobbies, education, careers, entertainment, legitimate means. But they also try illegitimate means, sexual immorality, drugs, other sins. None of these can satisfy what it is. That's what Christ means when He says, if you try to find your life, you'll lose it. Because people try to fill their life with all these activities, whether good or bad, legal or illegal, and they, they try to build their life around these things. Christ says you're just going to lose your life in the end because you haven't made sure to lose your life. It's a paradox. It's irony. Jesus says, but if you lose your life, you'll find it. Well, how do we lose our life? Well, we lose our life in Christ. We lose our will when we submit to His will. We lose our sovereignty when we submit ourselves to His commands. We lose our future when we decide we're going to submit to the future that He has in store for us in our life. You see, we lose the authority that we have in our life, but yet we gain eternal salvation because we've decided that we're going to live with Him for all of eternity. Ecclesiastes 12, verses 13 through 14 says, Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the duty of all man. For God will bring every deed into the judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it be good or evil. People who find their life in Christ will also find it in eternity. In Colossians chapter 3, in that passage, Paul says that when Christ appears, if you have hidden your life with Christ, then you're going to find your eternal salvation there with Christ. And so, are you living for yourself? Are you living for your own desires, your own means, your own goals, your own sovereignty? Or have you lost those things so you can see Christ in you, so others can see Christ in you? If you've done that, then you truly have lost your life, and yet at the same time have found an eternal life in its place. The sixth thing is, is that reward is waiting. Let's look at verses 40 through 42. As Jesus closes this discourse, as He's sending these disciples out, He wants to remind them at the very end that a reward is waiting for them. Whoever receives you receives Me, and whoever receives Me receives Him who sent Me. The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple. Truly I say to you, he will, be, he will by no means lose his reward. A righteous person, a just person, is someone who is living their life, conforming their life to the will and the Word of God. You may say, well, he thinks he's righteous. You know, he thinks he's just, just a righteous person. Well, I hope I'm a righteous person. I hope you are too. Because righteous person means that you're living your life according to the will of God. It doesn't mean you're a perfect person, but that you're striving to follow God's will and His Word. Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, 8, Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord will give to me on that day, and not only me, but to all who have loved His appearing. The crown of righteousness. That's the reward that all of us are striving for, to live a, a righteous life. And the one who receives a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Even if you're not a prophet, if you receive a prophet, you will get that reward. Jesus says, whoever receives me receives my reward. Well, what reward did Jesus have? Well, in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5, it talks about how we can have the same reward as Christ. Christ lived a life obedient to the Father. And so when He died, His body was not forsaken. It was raised from the grave because He had accomplished the Father's will. Romans chapter 6, verses 3-5 through 5 says that if we take part in Christ's death, we will also take, place, take part in His resurrection. That passage says, Do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were buried therefore with Him in baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead of the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. If we take part in the same death as Christ, our death in baptism, Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ, then we will also get to be raised with Christ. We get to have His reward because we have accepted Him. And then Matthew chapter 25, verses 37-40 through 40 tells us that no good deed that we do here on earth goes unnoticed. Jesus says, Then the righteous will answer Him, saying, Lord, when did we see You hungry and feed You? 
or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say to them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to the one of least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. And then, of course, in our passage in Matthew 10, he says, Even just a cup of water, that same phrase that we sang in that song, Jesus says he'll by no means lose his reward. A day of reward is coming to those who faithfully hold fast to the gospel, who faithfully live out their lives in a righteous way, submitting themselves to the will and the word of God. And that is the message that Jesus wanted to give those disciples before he sent them out. And it's the exact same message that you and I need today, whether we're fixing to be sent out to school in a, for, in a different town, whether we're about to be sent out in the workplace for this week, or just being sent out in this town of Chapel Hill or wherever you reside. It's important for us to remember these six things, that we are an extension of Jesus' ministry, that we've got to know when to leave and shake the dust off our feet and not stop, but go on to someone else. Persecutions will come, but be courageous and do not have any fear. Be dedicated and persevere in the face of everything because we have a reward that is waiting for us. So let us, as the church here at Chapel Hill, strive to have a, per a passion and a purpose each day that we live for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, there's a reward waiting for the righteous. But in order to be counted with the righteous, you've got to submit yourself to the will and the word of God. And you've got to ask yourself, have I done that? Have I confessed that Christ is Son of God? Romans 10.10. 10. Have I been buried with Him in baptism that I might be raised in newness of life? Romans 6, 3 through 5. And can I say that I'm awaiting that righteous crown that the Lord is going to give to those who have loved Him and His appearing? 2 Timothy 4.8. If you haven't done that, obey His will and His word and become a Christian. For the vast majority of us here tonight, if you are a Christian, remember that we've got to be disciples who have been sent out. When you send someone out, it's to accomplish a purpose and a goal. Ask yourself, is my spiritual walk accomplishing anything, both in my life and in the life of someone else? Am I changing? Am I growing? Am I becoming more like Christ? Because if you're not, what commission are you fulfilling? If you're not seeking opportunities to share your faith with others and bring them to a knowledge of the faith, ask yourself, am I fulfilling the commission that Christ has given me? Because we haven't been saved just to sit on the sidelines. We've been saved to get in the game and to make a difference. And if we're not doing that, then we're going to find ourselves as disciples who have failed the Lord who has sent us out to make a difference in this world. And so if you're here tonight and you need to put on Christ in baptism or renew your spiritual walk with Him, please come now as we stand and as we sing.